Hey, hey, hey. there we go. We got a chee -hoo. I don't know if you were here in, uh, what was the month of Christmas? December. Uh, December, uh, when we were talking about the cow fida, uh, we read it in Hawaiian Pigeon if you were here, and we learned that in Hawaiian, when you cheer, it's a chee -hoo. So, uh, I was just there last week. If, if you were here, you heard Diana tell you that. But uh, I was there visiting. My son is stationed there. He's in the Marine Corps. So for the last four years, we've had to go visit him in Oahu. It's been rough. They have three kids, our grandkids. But one of the days, we actually, uh, they got a babysitter. And since he's in the military, he can get cheap flights island to island. We jumped over to Kauai, and we did a hike and we are hiking right along this ridge, and we looked across this huge valley. I don't know if you've ever been there, but there were like seven or eight waterfalls going down. And I'm telling you, I had this incredible worship experience for a moment. Because I'm looking at that, I'm going, God, you made this. You are so amazing. And so we got to just, we got to do it Hawaiian style, though, and just give them a chi hoo. Ready? On three. One, two, three. Chi hoo. Yeah. Because God is amazing and he is good and what he has made is so incredibly beautiful. Oh God, help us get what we're going to look at tonight. This, this is maybe my favorite passage and I mean it this time. <laughs> oh, but God, please help us get this. Some of us have heard this so many times that it can just become routine. And, and help us to not have this routine tonight, God. For some that are maybe hearing some of these things for the first time, oh, would you just blow their minds with this truth. Whatever the case, Jesus, please, please, I beg you. I beg you. Help us get this as if it's the first time that we've ever heard it. Help us to be overwhelmed with this truth tonight. We love you, Jesus, and all God's people said... Amen. So here's a quote. You might want to write this down, take a picture of it. It's going to be up on the screen. This is the key of what we're going to look at tonight. Because of Jesus, we work from acceptance by God, not for acceptance by God. Because of Jesus, we work from acceptance by God, not for acceptance by God. I'm going to say that again. Take a picture of it. You want to get this. Because of Jesus, we work from acceptance by God, not for acceptance by God. Sometimes people say, well, well, works have nothing to do with salvation. No. Works have nothing to do with getting salvation. But works are part of the salvation process. You, it didn't get you your salvation. That's why Paul in Philippians says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, he says, you were created in Christ Jesus for good works. We don't work for our salvation. Again, that quote, because of Jesus, we work from acceptance by God, not for acceptance by God. Oh, that we would get that. So here's what we're going to do tonight. We're in Hebrews. Um, can you just thank Diana last week? She did an amazing job. I watched it today online. She just did an amazing job. So we're in Ephesians or Hebrews chapter 4. So open to Hebrews 4. Put a finger there or something there to hold that spot. If you have a smart device, just wait because go back to Leviticus then. Leviticus chapter 16. Actually, go to Matthew 27. See, this is how confusing it's going to be tonight. We're going to start in Leviticus 16, third book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Go to the beginning, turn to the right, Leviticus 16. Then we're going to flip over to Matthew chapter 27, and then we're going to jump into Hebrews chapter 4. Because why we're starting in Leviticus 16 and jumping to Matthew chapter 27 is we need to understand this tabernacle, temple idea. So, Mike Runners, you ready? Here's the first question for those of you that know the, the history of this a little bit. Why the tabernacle? Why the temple? Why did God do that? There's multiple answers, so it's not like there's one right answer. But, but why the tabernacle? Why the temple? The tabernacle was the one that they could pack up and move. That was the tent. That was the one they used in the wilderness before Solomon built a temple. You have the tabernacle and the temple. Why those? Why did God set those up? Go ahead. Not everyone at once. There, here we go. We got one right here. Right here. Oh, we got one over there too. I didn't. I believe he set it up so that his presence could be available to us. He would be with us that way. Yes. Yes. In fact, 
the, the word tabernacle, the Hebrew word, and then later it was translated into Greek in the Septuagint, tabernacle actually means to dwell. In Revelation, when it talks about that God is going to come and dwell amongst us, his people, the future, the, the literal translation of that could be he's going to tabernacle with us. He's going to dwell with us. So that was part of it. It was a picture of God dwelling with his people. If you remember, the tabernacle was in the camp of Israel. So it was God saying, I'm going to tabernacle. I'm going to dwell with you as people. Good. What, we had someone up here. Where Do we have someone else right up here? And we got someone right here. Were you raising your hand? And right here. There we go. The tabernacle was temporary. It wasn't permanent. It was temporary. Yes. And it was temporary because it was a foreshadow of, of what? Christ, of Christ being uh, and the spirit being in you. Yeah. But they also celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. Yeah. Where they all came in temporary dwellings. Yep. And they went to the feast in temporary dwellings. Yep. Yep. So it was, a, it was temporary. It wasn't, and, and again, that's part of what we're going to talk about. Right over here. So more to that, it was God's holy place on earth. God's At holy the, place. Before yep. the temple. And of course, the Ark of the Covenant and all that. Yep. Right? Yep. Okay. Yep. In fact, it was so holy, as we're going to see, it was called the holy place and the holy of holies. The Shekinah glory of God was there in the holy of holies. It was so holy that only the high priest could go in once a year. So let me back up a little bit here. Leviticus chapter 16, we're going to go back to the beginning of the story. So here's, here's um, we're going to do a little bit of history. Let me try that again. We're going to do a little bit of history. <laughs> yeah. Now, you got to love history because this is where we get the context of what's going on, okay? So we're going to back up 2,000 years to Jesus, and then we're going to back up another 1,500 years before Jesus. So we're backing up about 3,500 years in history, and this is where the nation of Israel had been enslaved by the Egyptians. They're miraculously freed the 10 plagues. They cross the Red Sea. They go down to Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, they get the 10 commandments, and they get instructions to build the tabernacle. Now, part of the building of the tabernacle, in fact, you'll see a picture on the screen. i got to stand still now because I can't move when that picture's up there and I'm on the screen at the same time. This is so hard for me to do. Okay, that's the tabernacle. That was what it would have looked like, the original one, where they were moving. Because remember, they're wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. And then it, was, it would be another, uh, about another 400 years before the temple, a permanent tabernacle, was actually built. So that's what it would have looked like for them. There was actually the fence around it. And inside of the fence, only the Levites and the priests were allowed. You see an altar there, and that's where they would sacrifice. And then there was the water basin uh, right before they would go into the holy place place and then they would go inside to the holy place and there was three things in the holy place uh, on the left you had the candle brom the candles and and that was remember Jesus said I am the light of the world but if you look at actually what a candle brom looks like it actually looks like a tree it was a picture of the tree of life God's original plan was this perfect place but that's what would light up that place on the right it was you went in the holy place you have the table of showbread and on the Sabbath, on Shabbat, every week, the, the priests would come in, they would eat the bread, and then they would replace the bread. Remember, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And then uh, in front of that, you had the altar of incense. That was right before you would go into the holy place. And then there was this curtain separating the holy place from the holy of holies. And the Holy of Holies had the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant actually had two cherubim, uh, angels, that had their wings like this over what they called the mercy seat. This is all very important. This is critical that you get. Because you see what would happen on Yom Kippur, this is Leviticus 16 now, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the one day of the year that not just anybody, only the high priest could go in there. And you remember, we looked at this a few weeks ago. I'm going to start reading in Leviticus 16, verse 6. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin, because remember, the high priest also had sin, to make atonement for himself and his household, verse 7. Then he used to take the two goats, because remember, they would take two goats. They would cast lots. One would become the scapegoat, and the other one would be sacrificed. And the, 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 the high priest would take the blood of that goat that was sacrificed. And the one time, the only time in the entire year, he would go into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle some of that blood on the mercy seat between the, air, the cherubim's wings. One day of the year. 
Now, it's critical that we know that because remember, Hebrews was written to Jewish believers. So everyone reading this letter 2,000 years ago, they know all this history. They know all of this. Okay, so now we're going to jump forward in history. Remember, we went back 3,500 years. Uh, about 500, 400, 500 years after that, Solomon builds the first temple. That temple stands until about 586 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Babylonians, comes, destroys it, takes them off into captivity. Uh, about uh, years later, a couple decades later, uh, they come back. This is Ezra, Nehemiah in the Bible. They rebuild the temple. And that temple actually stood uh, in about 168 B.C. A guy named Antiochus Epiphanes comes in and desecrates the temple, sacrifices a pig on the altar. You and I are going, you and I go, Big deal. I mean, I like a pork sandwich, but to a Jew, uh, pigs were unclean. And so Antiochus Epiphanes knew that, and he desecrates the temple. He sacrifices a pig on the altar, actually sets up an altar for Jupiter, a, a, a false god that they worshipped. 70 AD then, remember Jesus comes around 4 BC. Uh, 70 AD, about 70 years before Jesus arrives, the Romans go in and they completely destroy this second temple. First temple was built by Solomon. Second temple was built after they come back from captivity. In 70 BC, uh, the Romans come in and they destroy the second temple. A couple of decades later, a guy named Herod the Great, not a good guy, Herod the Great starts rebuilding the temple. And that's the temple that stood during the time of Jesus. So you're going to see a picture on the screen. Go ahead and put that next one up there. You'll see a picture on the screen on what this would have looked like during Jesus' time. This was the temple during the time of Jesus. So you see that little boundary around there, that, that picture? That's actually the boundary where the, the Jews could go inside of that. Gentiles were not allowed inside of that boundary. Then when you went inside that larger wall, that was the court of women. And then you went to the next one, and that's where the priests, and you have the altar, and the altar of, or the, the altar where they would sacrifice, and you have the altar, uh, um, the water basin. And then you'd go into that tall building, that's the holy place. And they would go inside the holy place. Remember, that's the three things. You got the candlebrom, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. And then once a year, their very back room, the Holy of Holies, on Yom Kippur, the high priest would go in. There's another picture. Go ahead and put that next one up there. This is actually a, a really good drawing of what it would have looked like, looked like during the time of Jesus. So that whole thing is the temple, the temple courts. So most of that, if you were Gentiles, most of us in here are Gentiles, we could wander around in most of that. See that little tiny, short, little fence-looking thing? That was, there was a little fence there that said, if you're a Gentile, you can't go any further than that. This is all really important. Some of you, I see your eyes glazing over. You're going, come on, you got to get this, you got to get this. Otherwise, we're going to read this passage and you're going to be like, eh, who cares? No, 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 you got to get this. Gentiles, you couldn't go past there. Then you had the court of women. Women, you couldn't go any farther. Even if you were a Jewish woman, you could not go any further than that. Then you only had the Levites and the priests could go into a certain area of the temple, the altar and the, and the water basin. And then only the priests could go into the holy place. And then only the high priest, only on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, could you go into the Holy of Holies. Now, you got that whole background. Turn to Matthew chapter 27. Watch this. This is, this is now we're, we're, we're with Jesus. Jesus is hanging on the cross. Matthew 27, verse 44, 45. From the sixth hour, that's about noon uh, on the Jewish time. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, so from noon to about 3 p.m., darkness came over all the land. Jesus is hanging on the cross. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, that, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 47. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar. I wish I had time to tell you about the significance of that. That is no accident. It goes back to something that Jesus said during the Passover meal. We'll look at that another day. Can't wait, can you? He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Verse 51, at that moment, the curtain of the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was torn in two from top to bottom. There's some significance here. 
Now flip over to Hebrews chapter 4 and start looking at what this writer uh, says here. Remember, he's writing to Jewish believers. He's writing to Jewish believers that are in intense persecution. He's writing to Jewish believers who are going, oh, I don't know if this is worth it. Some of them are maybe thinking about turning back. And he's saying, no, no, persevere, hold firmly because Jesus is better than, and then he starts this letter. He's better than Moses. He's better than the angels. He's better than the temple. He's better than Joshua. So watch what he does now. Verse 14, chapter four, verse 14. Therefore, whenever you see the word therefore, see what it's there for. It's connecting to what Diana talked about last week. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven. Now, most of the time when we read ascended into heaven, we're thinking of the time when Jesus, Acts chapter 1, stood on the top of the Mount of Olives right before he ascended into heaven. And we're going, oh, that's what they're talking about. No, remember, the Jewish believers, as soon as they talk about a high priest, what does the high priest do on Yom Kippur? They go into the Holy of Holies. But you see here where he's already getting across this high priest, Jesus, oh, he's better than any other high priest because he didn't just go into the Holy of Holies. He went into heaven itself. It shows this continual access to God. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess for, why do we hold firmly? For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize That's two Greek words that are put together that literally means feel with. He's saying, we have a high priest now, this high priest Jesus. He's better than any other high priest because first of all, he ascended into the heavens. He's in the heavens, not just the Holy of Holies, but the heavens. And he feels with you and me. This is one of my favorite verses, and I mean it this time, I do. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then, because of this, let us approach God's throne of grace. If you have a Bible, a hard copy Bible, you should circle those words throne of grace and write in the margin seat of mercy because a better translation of that would be let us approach the seat of mercy Remember, this is written to Jewish believers. What did the high priest do once a year on Yom Kippur? They'd go to the Holy of Holies where you have the Ark of the Covenant and two cherubim angels with their wings spread out over the mercy seat. And this, this, this writer is saying, let us then approach God's seat of mercy. Let us? Wait, we're not high priests. What do you mean let us approach the seat of mercy with confidence? Let us then approach the seat of mercy with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We're going to come back to that part about why we get to do that. But let me just ask this question again, Mike Runners. Why, I I said verse 15 was one of my favorite verses and 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 I, I do, I think I really mean it this time. But why would I say that? Why would, let me read that verse again. Why is this verse, should be one of your favorite verses too, by the way. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize or feel with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Why is that verse so hopeful? Why should that be one of our favorite verses? Right here. Because up until that time, every priest that offered sacrifice, whether it be the the Levite priest or the high priest, was with sin. Yeah. Though he was like us, he was man, he was with us, he would have to. He still had to atone for his own sin. Yeah. But Christ had no sin. Yeah. Yeah, Leviticus 16. So when Aaron, the first high priest, went in, he had to make a sacrifice for himself as well as all the people because he himself was a sinner too. So this high priest, the high priest throughout history, they were sinners like us. But this high priest, well, he had no sin. But there's, there's even more. There's another, there's another part of it that's so hopeful for us. Well, he, he's now the advocate for us. 
Oh. So he can advocate for us and the God. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and the curtain was ripped from God to us. So he tore it open from God to man. Yeah. And tore the curtain open so we can now come before God. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to come back to that idea. Don't forget that, what he said, that, that, that Jesus is now advocating for us. We're going to come back to that idea. Actually, the writer comes back to that idea in a few verses. Is, it, is this on? Yeah. I think it's something that we can be encouraged by because Jesus kind of sets the example that, yeah, he can be tempted by sin just as we are, but shows us a way to not be tempted. Yeah. To not give in to that temptation. Yep. But he was tempted. Right? There's a lot of hope in that. He suffered. There's a lot of hope in that. How many of you have been to a funeral of a loved one? You pray to a God who was at a funeral of a loved one. You pray to a God who feels with you when you weep at that funeral of a loved one. Because... He wept at Lazarus' funeral. At some point, he buried his earthly father, Joseph. We, we have a God who we pray to. Do you get the gravity of this? We have a God that we pray to that feels with us because he took on human flesh and suffered the way we do. He felt pain the way we do. He felt exhaustion the way we do. He, he, he was tempted with sins the way we are. And so when, when we go to God now, you and I can't go, you know, God, you just don't understand what it's like. Because now Jesus can stand up <laughs> and say, yes, I do. And I feel with you. Isn't that amazing? And next time you are deep in grief, Next time you are deep in pain, some of you are right now. Next time you are deep in suffering, next time you are deep in temptation, remember you are talking to a God who feels with you. That's amazing to me. See why this is one of my favorite verses? Isn't that incredible truth? So, so keep reading. Look at, look at, keep going. So verse 5, every high priest is selected from among the people. Remember Jesus was fully God and fully man. He was fully human. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people. Okay, remember this gentleman here talked about Jesus is our advocate now. A high priest was representing the people. So, again, this is why I laid out the, the tabernacle or the temple for you. Remember, all the people are back here. The priest would go in with the sacrifices at the altar or on Yom Kippur on the Day of Atonement. The high priest would go in to the mercy seat into the Holy of Holies. But the people were back there and God was here. And so the, the priest back to the people and face to God was a picture of him representing God to the people or representing people to the God. And, and so when this, when this writer is trying to get us to understand this Jesus, do you understand who this Jesus is? He's saying this high priest is, is better than any of those high priests because now he's representing us to God. Not a human high priest who fails, who sins, who has to offer sacrifices for himself, but God himself, Jesus in the flesh is now representing you and me before the Father. Which is why later in this letter, he's going to tell you and I that we are perfect in Christ. I've, I think I said this before, but a guy I used to work with years ago, whenever someone would come up and say, how you doing? He'd always say, I'm perfect. And they go, well, no one's perfect. And he says, I am. Read your Bible, Hebrews chapter 10. <laughs> and it's true because our advocate is Jesus and he took your sins and my sins on himself and he's advocating for us. The father no longer looks at Pat McCullough as the sinner. He sees Pat McCullough as his perfect son. And you as his perfect son or daughter if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Whew. Oh God, help us get this. Okay, keep reading. Watch this. And no one takes, uh, uh, sorry, verse 5, every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. 
So a high priest would actually know. If you came to a high priest and said, you don't know what it's like to, to struggle with temptation and suffering. And the high priest would go, well, yes, I do. And now the high priest, Jesus, can say the same thing to us because he took on flesh. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for our own sins as well as for the sins of people. Because this other high priest was a sinner. Verse 4, watch this. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when, God, when called by God, just as Aaron was. Now, there's two things happening here. Most of you have probably heard the fact that this is going to come, he's going to quote about Melchizedek and a, a verse from Psalms. And most of you have probably been taught and heard that he's referring to the fact that you can't just choose to be a high priest. And that is true. There's something else going on historically that may be what this author is also doing. Because see, during the second temple period, this is why I gave you the history lesson. First temple was built by Solomon and was destroyed in 586 BC. A couple of decades later, they come back, Ezra and Nehemiah, they rebuild this temple, the second temple. Well, during the second temple period, there became this huge mess with the high priests. In fact, by the time of Jesus, the high priest was not anything like what they were originally meant to be. Selected by God to represent the people to God, it actually became this political mess. And if you remember, when Jesus is arrested and he's brought to these different trials the night before he's crucified, he's brought to Pilate, the Roman, and Caiaphas, the high priest. The high priest, instead of representing the people to God by this time during the second temple period for hundreds of years, it actually became this political piece where now they had power and money and influence. And, and so the, the writer here is maybe, certainly is referencing the fact that every high priest has to be called by God. So was Jesus. But this writer may also be doing a little dig on what's going on there and saying, this Jesus, it wasn't a political power move by him. Like what we've been enduring, if the writer was saying, like what we've been enduring for the last few hundred years and what we're seeing right now in our country. That's what the writer might have been saying. Verse five, in the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. Oh, verse six, and he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This is the first time he's gonna use that word Melchizedek. And I so wish I could unpack that for you. He's gonna actually talk about Melchizedek seven more times. You do not wanna miss the rest of Hebrews. Because I'm not going to talk about Melchizedek tonight. We're going to talk about it in the future when he brings that up again. But you do not want to miss. Because there is something unique and special about this king priest named Melchizedek that mysteriously shows up on the scene before a tabernacle even exists. King priest, king and priest were not the same thing. Who mysteriously shows up on the scene. Clear back with Abraham. The tabernacle doesn't exist. There's no sacrifice system yet. And yet there's this, who is this Melchizedek? Come back in cupping weeks. You don't want to miss that, promise you. Verse 7, all right. What do you think, I'm going to read it. Mike Runners, get ready. What do you think the author is referencing in verse 7, okay? During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. I'm gonna read that again. What do you think he's referencing here? During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. What do you think he's referencing? Yeah, I can hear you, so I'll repeat it. Yep, Garden of Gethsemane. Yep, I, I would agree. We don't know for sure. It probably might go even beyond that. But certainly part of it, now tie this together because remember what he just got done saying. He's going, you know what one of the hopes is? Is that the high priest that we have now that is advocating for us before God isn't like any other high priest that had to sacrifice for themselves. This is God in the flesh. And this high priest now that's advocating for us, he knows what we feel. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our pain. He knows our suffering. And then in this verse, in verse 7, he seems to reference the time 
time that, that Jesus suffered maybe worse than any other time, those last 24 to 48 hours of his life. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's offering up tear, prayers and petitions and tears, and he's sweating blood, and he's saying, take this cup from me. And I don't think that you and I will ever taste the kind of suffering that he tasted in the garden that night. I know we will never face the suffering that Jesus faced on the cross. Because when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In this book later on, we're going to be told he will never leave you or forsake you. Because of what Jesus did, we will never experience the suffering that he faced on that cross and the loneliness and the sin. But even in the garden, when the weight of the sin of the world started pressing down on him, remember that the next time you feel pain and suffering and loneliness and hurt and agony, you are praying to a God who knows. He experienced it. But watch this. Verse 8. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. That's a, that's a strange verse. Wait, Jesus had to learn obedience? I thought he was perfect. What does that mean? Well, the word learned actually can be translated instructor. In fact, here's another way to put this. That suffering becomes our instructor. Jesus was instructed by suffering. Would be another way to say that. One of the greatest teachers that we have in life is what? Experience and suffering. I, oh, I wish it was different. But, but you know it as well as I do, that one of the greatest teachers in life is suffering. This is the theology of suffering, I think, is one of the things that is least and terribly taught in our culture. But it's in the Bible. We don't have time to unpack it tonight, so come back in coming weeks. But the theology of suffering, because, because what it's saying here is suffering becomes our instructor. And in fact, it's saying suffering was an instructor for Jesus. He was perfect. But again, it's tied to that fact that we have a high priest who understands our suffering. Remember in the garden where he's saying, God, take this father, take this cup from me. And what was the answer? No. And then he got up after praying that three times and resolutely went to the cross. You ever been told no by God? You ever, got, you ever begged God to take a pain or a suffering from you? Sometimes the answer is yes. By the way, it's not wrong to pray that prayer. Jesus prayed it. You're crazy not to pray it. God is a God of miracles. Pray it. But sometimes his answer will be no. And, and that instructor called suffering can do some incredible work in our lives. I don't say that lightly because I know some of you are there. I was there recently. It's, it's painful. But I look back on those times in my life and I go, God, those were some of the sweetest times I had with you. When I was at the end of myself and on my face, begging for mercy, begging for help. I was talking to a gentleman before and we were talking about this. This is the most powerful position for you and I as humans. And sometimes we don't ever get to this position without suffering. Theology of suffering. We're going to come back to that later in this book because the writer does. All right, verse 9. Woo, here we go. Love this one. And once made perfect, 
Uh, remember, Jesus is perfect. So again, that's another strange verse. People look at that and go, wait, and once made perfect, how is Jesus? I thought he was already perfect. Okay, the Greek word that's used there can also mean like complete or passing the test. Once Jesus passed the test, once Jesus perfected the test, he became the source of, what's the next word? Eternal, you should circle, highlight, underline that word in your Bible. The eternal salvation for, next word, all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of, uh, there it is again, Melchizedek, we're not going to talk about it tonight, we're going to come back to it. But look at this, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation. Now again, you and I read that and we're going, huh. But a Jewish Christian 2,000 years ago who grew up in this system knows that how often does the high priest have to go into the Holy of Holies? Just once a year, but they have to do it year after year after year after year after year, which means that when they brought that blood to the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant under the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and they sprinkled it there, it was a covering, but it did not take away the sins because the next year they'd have to come back and do it again. So when the writer is telling these people that are suffering, he's saying, don't turn back. Don't turn away from this Jesus. Persevere in the midst of your suffering because he's so much better than everything. And in this section, he's saying he's better than any high priest because this high priest gives us eternal salvation. Because never again will a high priest need to go in and sprinkle blood on the Ark of the Covenant because Jesus did that once for all. On the cross, right before he died, he uttered these three words. It is, it is finished. And it's all tied to this. And the, and the curtain does what? It splits. Now what does, what does, Mike Runners, get ready. What does this do for you as a Jesus follower? What does this, for most of you, reminder, for some of you, maybe the first time you've heard some of these things, but for most of you, reminder, what does that do for your soul to be reminded of this incredible truth? What we're going to do right now is we're going to take a moment and have a bragging session about our God. That's really what we're going to do. What does this do for your soul, knowing this truth, being reminded of this truth? It's a peace and confidence in my walk with God yeah. and how I conduct myself and I live by faith. Yeah, peace and confidence. You used the same word that he used, the writer used in this. Approach the seat of mercy with confidence because it's finished, yeah. Me great, great, everlasting joy yeah. to know that now heaven was open to me. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, remember the picture of the temple. Most of us in here are Gentiles. We weren't even allowed to go to, we could only go to a certain. And then women could only go to a certain. And then Levites could only go to a certain. And then the priests could only go to a certain. And then high priests could. And now it's open for how many people? For all because of what Jesus did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah it reminds me that God desires a personal relationship with me. So he initiated the effort to tear down that barrier between man and, and the Holy of Holies. Yeah, yeah. I love the word you used, initiated. In fact, that's going to be a key thought that the writer is going to use. Later on in Hebrews, he's going to use the phrase author and perfecter of our faith. What does he mean when he's saying the author of our faith? He initiated it. When, when, when God in eternity passed, go back with me in your mind, eternity passed, that hurts my head, okay? Before anything existed, and God put this plan in place, as I've said before, he was not surprised when sin entered. He didn't all of a sudden go, oh, uh-oh, what do we do now? He knew that was gonna happen. This was his plan. He initiated this. He knew that when he created us, and he was gonna create us in his image with a will to choose to love him or rebel against him. And he knew we would rebel against him. And he knew then the only way to make that right was that he was going to have to do this whole thing we talked about tonight. And he loved you and me enough that he said, I'm going to create him. 
and I'm going to initiate that word. I love it. I'm going to initiate this knowing that even after they come to me, they will rebel against me at times. Even after they choose to follow me, even after they stand in church and sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound, they'll turn around and spit in my face the next day at times. And I'll still initiate this plan. And I'll make sure that they are my eternal son or daughter. Oh, what else? Back here. I think it marks the completion of hope. There is a hope for when I wake up in the morning with uh, this unbearable pain because of a loss of a loved one or because of the pressure of whatever I'm going through, there is hope. Yeah. And that's what he's completing through all of this. There is no longer a hope on a high priest. Maybe he'll survive. Maybe he won't going into the Holy of Holies because he's tied to a rope. Yeah. He's, there's just hope. And that's it's basically saying that there's all that we need is just his hope. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, so true. You're, you're, oh, I'm having a hard time holding back because I want to go, we're talking about the theology of suffering and you mentioned a couple of things that are there so key for us to understand. We're going to talk about them later in this book. Don't miss it. You're not going to want to miss it, but hope is a big part. We're going to come back to that one, but yes, hope, hope, hope. Yep, what else? Right here. I have kind of a theology or a history question with this concept. Yeah. So, before Jesus dies and the, the veil is torn or the fabric is torn, could Jews at that time, like we, we gather and sing and sometimes we get chills in here, like we'll feel the Holy Spirit and we'll feel that presence of God. Could they not do that before, before the curtain was torn or was it just symbolically saying... Does that, does that make sense, my yes. question? Yeah, I was just making sure you were done with your question. I didn't want to interrupt you. Okay, okay great question. So... Um, there's two different thoughts on this one. So the, the one that is often taught is that the dwelling place of God or the presence of God was in the Holy of Holies and um, that changed when Jesus came. But there's another thought that I actually lean a little more toward that yes, there was the Shekinah glory of God, the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, just like you and you, you've probably experienced sometimes a, a special presence of God. There's probably been times when you've been worshiping or singing or praying and you're just overwhelmed with the presence of God. And yet, if you are a child of God, Romans 8, 9 teaches, the Holy Spirit is in you. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. So God is always with you, but there are times when there's a special presence. So before Jesus came, yes, people could experience the presence of God. Yes, people could experience the Spirit of God. Yes, people could worship. In fact, Psalms is full of writers worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Yes. So um, there, there was, but, but what we do see is that presence. Remember the dwelling, the tabernacle was the dwelling of God. He was there, but, the, but what the, the tabernacle was really displaying was that there was a sin problem. Even though God's presence was with the people, there was a sin problem that had to be dealt with. And the high priest going in year after year after year, well, they covered it, but they had to keep going in. Jesus came and he dealt with that sin problem once for all. But, but Abraham could experience the presence of God. Moses could experience the presence of God. David could experience, Esther could experience the presence of God. Ruth could experience the presence of God. Yeah. Okay, and the other thing I wanted to bring up as well, as you're talking through this, you've really got me to think about it, even though I do, but you've really got me to think about it deeper still, just that what God went through for us to make it possible so we have access at any time to him. We don't have to wait to one time a year. We can go to him at any time, and he will be there for us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish, because I, I grew up hearing this stuff my whole life. I'm, I'm, I'm as, as bad or worse than maybe any of you that, that were privileged enough to grow up in a Christian home. Some of you, this is newer for you, and, I, and, and there's, there's, there's some value to that because you're going, oh, but oh, for us that have heard this so many times, if, if we could just get the gravity of this. Jesus did this for us. And, and like you said, the, 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 the level of suffering that he faced is something that none of us will ever experience or even know. None of us will. 
None of us will ever feel the weight of the sin of the world. Every rape, every murder, the gas chambers of Germany, the genocide of Rwanda where in 90 days almost a million people are slaughtered, uh, the lies, the hatred, the, all of that was pressed down on Jesus that night in the garden and he began to feel the weight of the sin of the world. And, and so if, if, oh man, God, help us get this. If, there's, if, if we could get not just the, the amount of pain that he suffered for us, but the amount of love that is, is was shared over here was initiated by God before the foundation of the world. Whew. Wow. One more. So what you just said is, is, is what I was thinking about, and it's um, Romans 8, 39, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Yeah. So the love of God is in yeah. Jesus. That's what, yeah. Yeah. Can you hold on the mic one moment? I'm going to have you read that verse again in a second. Let me just finish with this story about that verse, because I love that. This, this was God ordained right now. Thank you for reading that. So um, years ago, I was asked if I would go visit a woman who was dying of AIDS here in um, Phoenix. And when I walked into the room, I don't think I've ever seen someone that looks so dead, barely alive. Like I've never seen walking death. Uh, she was so emaciated and shriveled. There was hardly anything left of her. Her eyes were sunken. They didn't even look like there was any life in there. She had been a prostitute and a drug addict, which is how she got AIDS. And we, and we, we were able to present the, the gospel to her and talk to her about Jesus. I said, um, do you know this Jesus? And she said, I know about him. And I said, but, but do you want to know him? Not just know about him. And so I, I shared the hope that her salvation was not based on what she did or didn't do. I mean, she only had moments to live. She'd wasted her whole life. And then her name was Dee. And I said, Dee, can I read something to you? And I opened up to this verse and I read, would you read those verses again? Imagine a woman who's moments away from dying, hearing these words. Romans 8, 39, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will, a will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Mm. Wow. And within a few hours of us leaving that little apartment, she was dead. But because she put her faith in Jesus and nothing can separate us from the love of God, she was more alive than she had ever been, right? That's, that's what the author's trying to get across. Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you for who you are. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us. Forgive us, forgive me for taking this for granted so often, God. Your grace is so great, your mercy is so great that it not only saved us, but it saved us from our sins after you saved us. <laughs> Jesus, Right now I do, I, I just pray that your spirit would somehow put this in our hearts and minds. Some that have heard this since they were little boys or girls. Overwhelm us with this truth. Because of what you did, Jesus, once for all, nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from your love. We love you, Jesus. And all God's people said,
Amen. Have a great week and love Jesus.